Thank you very much, um, Bobby. Um, this, um, I had a similar situation um, when I was working at the British Library was we just finished the Center for Conservation, a $25 million project. It was such a celebration. And the night before, um, the architects um, of the British Library died. But we decided to go ahead with it, the celebration because in honor of, of him, and so um, when Bobby um, told me the news just earlier, we decided to, um, to go ahead with the talk in Frank's honor, and I would have been meeting with him tomorrow. Um, as two newbies, he was two months into being the uh, university librarian, and I'm six months into being deputy director of, um, of Harvard University Library. So we'll go ahead. So um, this is um, a talk that um, Bobby invited me to give about a year ago, and it's um, an enormous privilege and honor to be invited to give the talk. Um, We'll turn the lights down in a second. Um, and it's, um, it's a privilege to be giving it to this, um, to this audience because um, I was thinking about it. There's only a couple of things to which I think I can lay claim. And one of them is that I'm guessing that I'm the only Brother Helen in the audience. Uh, and the reason that I'm Brother Helen is that um, I'm an associate of the Art Workers Guild which uh, was set up in the UK um, during the arts and crafts movement. Um, and we're all brethren, hence the brother Helen. Um, and I was taken there uh, and introduced to it by Roger Powell, who rebound the Book of Kells, uh, together with his partner, Douglas Cockrell, who rebound the uh, Codex Sinaiticus, and his son, Sandy Cockrell. And they laid the um, foundation of book and manuscript conservation, I think, in the UK. And their influences travel very widely. For example, um, Peter Waters at the Library of Congress. Well, Bobby invited me to give this talk last year. And I think um, I'm still slightly surprised to have taken the train this morning from Boston instead of having flown across from Heathrow. This time last year, when Bobby invited me, I was at the British Library where I was part of the senior leadership team and I was head of collection care. I was responsible for the care of 115 million items and 300 terabytes of electronic content. And those collections and that content, it ranged from medieval manuscripts and papyri and oracle bones through to literary authors' emails and websites of the UK web domain. So in my time at the BL, we completed the um, Center for Conservation We'd recently finished the um, 135 miles of storage um, of the storage building that built on the Yale Harvard model, high bay, high density, robotic, low oxygen storage, and half a mile of stock a day was being moved into that facility. Um, I was involved with the newspaper strategy, which was dealing with 750 million pages of news, um, physical newsprint. The digital library system was underway, and I helped establish the digital preservation. Um, that went from seven years ago, when there was not a single digital preservation professional in a UK library or archive, and I had to poach from Australia, to when I left, we then just had a retreat, and the, um, around the table, there was now 100 years of experience in digital preservation. And I was also just finishing the stewardship strategy for the British Library's physical and virtual collections for the next 10 years. So that was a year ago when Bobby invited me to give the talk. Scroll forward a year, and I've now been at Harvard six months, I'm currently responsible for the programs across the system of 73 libraries. So that's information systems, archives and records management, preservation, conservation, high density store, um, and um, the Office for Scholarly Communications, um, which champions open access. These provide the services across the library system, which you probably know is a very decentralized system. Plus, you may also know that at Harvard last year, the president and provost instigated a task force to look at the future of the entire 73 library system from a governance, a funding, and a structural perspective. On my second day, I joined the task force's work 
and it's looking at the strategic future of the library system. It's due to report in, a, in the near future, and so it wouldn't be appropriate um, for me to comment on that major fundamental review now, but there are already key directions that came out clearly, for example, working towards one integrated collection and being user-centric or putting the user as our primary focus. Well, for this talk, I'm going to pick out five or six paradoxes that I've been pondering around preservation, even though it's now not my primary focus. And as this is billed as a personal and strategic perspective, it's my take on things through the lens of having just moved 3,276 miles and through the lens of having journeyed from an artisan conservation to strategic management. I'm going to use a couple of examples from the British Library because you probably already know a lot about Harvard and may not be so acquainted with the BL. So a year ago I was working at the British Library, one of the greatest research libraries in the world, and now I'm at Harvard, one of the greatest research libraries in the world. The British Library now has a well-integrated preservation and conservation setup of which I'm extremely proud. And Harvard has an extremely impressive preservation and conservation setup. And on a personal note, I'd like to pay tribute to Jan Merrill Oldham, who retired last month. Her forethought and very wise decisions have created a very professional department. And as an aside, if anyone wants to talk to me at the reception, we'll be recruiting to that post later in the year. <laughs> The British Library has a stupendous and slightly irrational legacy from over 250 years, and Harvard has a phenomenal historical legacy of over 350 years. So they both have magnificent pasts, and I'll start with a very obvious, simple paradox, namely that people often think preservation is all about the past, but to my mind it's all about the future. It's about anticipating the future rather than adhering to the past and being able to look a user of the future in the metaphorical eye and say, well, we did our best to meet present needs and anticipate your needs. And that's also the user centricity that Harvard's task force is talking about. So from a simple one to um, the next paradox, there's been lots of talk that the rise in digital initiatives leads to the demise of the book and a lot of anxiety that that leads to a demise and the need for preservation. Paradoxically, not necessarily, and whatever, it's not that simple. Yes, last year, uh, excuse me, last week, Amazon said it sold more ebooks on Amazon.com during the pre previous 30 days than print books, that's both hardcover and paperback combined, of its bestseller list. Yes, we're seeing the complete life cycle of the media. Did you see that Sony this week, um, last week actually, um, it stopped making its Walkman tapes? So that's a 30-year full life cycle come and gone. Yes, Generation X, Generation Y, and Generation Z, all those digital natives, they have got expectations of access to everything at any time, in any place, anywhere. Brewster Kale, the internet archiver, he recently estimated that 100 million books will be disposed of across the US in the next 10 years. These are not unique items, but if they're disposed of, ironically, they might become more special. So here's the paradox. Brewster Kale, one of the earliest people to realize the fragility of websites and do something about it by setting up the Wayback Machine and the Internet Archive, in order to preserve the web. So he, quintessential internet archiver, is setting up a physical repository and is welcoming and will sto store discarded copies as everyone digitizes and discards. What the Brewster Kale example illustrates is that the physical is taking on greater significance when its existence is threatened, which is leading to a greater emphasis on preservation, ironically, where, where there has been uh, concern that preservation is threatened. I'm going to read you a quote taken from last month's launch of the British Library's vision for 2020. To put this in context, this strategic vision was posted just ahead of the Comprehensive Spending Review, which was the fundamental review 
of all federal funding, uh, all federal spending by the new coalition government. It's looking at everything from defense to education to health. And in the event, it made 19% cuts in government spending across the whole of the UK. My colleague at the BL, who'd been pro profiling 25% and 40% cuts, she made the wry comment, I never thought I'd say, Helen, that 15% would be a good result. Anyway, this is the BL's vision um, for 2020. Could you turn the lights down, please? We estimate that by 2020, 75% of all titles worldwide will be published in digital form only, or in both digital and print. Our ambition is to preserve digital content for the long term in order to safeguard our intellectual heritage so that it can be used by future generations of researchers. As digital formats become the norm, our rich resource of physical content will become more precious. It is thus vital that we continue to develop our world-class stewardship skills in conservation and preservation. So paradoxically, more preservation of more pre precious physical material, whilst also there's obviously the rise in digital preservation. This from an organization that is absolutely positioning itself in the forefront of the digital world. So the Prime Minister uh, launched Digital Britain from the British Library when I was there last year. Furthermore, <coughs> digitization, excuse me, <coughs> digitization can lead to greater emphasis and importance on the special physical, not less. And virtualization is leading to the creation of new digital entities. And as the mass digitization initi initiatives such as Google and the boutique digitization of small projects start to join up, they make for a new critical mass, a new massive digital entity that can be linked and mined and studied and used in ways that were unimaginable, unimaginable until recently. And I'll illustrate this with the digitization and virtual, and virtual reunification of the Codex Sinaiticus, which is the earliest existing text in the world of the New Testament. So, um, one of the only other claims I can make is that until the 6th of July last year, I was one of maybe three people alive who had seen all the surviving manuscript of the Codex Sinaiticus in the four locations, namely St. Catherine's Monastery in Egypt, from where the majority was taken in the 19th century by Tischendorf to Leipzig in Germany, and thence it went to St. Petersburg and then to London. On the, 16th, uh, excuse me, on the 6th of July last year, the digitized manuscripts were brought together virtually. And instead of their being, having been seen by three people in the world, on that day alone, they were viewed by 20 million people. So the Codex Sinaiticus project digitized all the leaves and fragments from the four locations. There are 347 leaves in the British Library in London, bought from the Russian government in 1933 for the equivalent of about $3 million. And they arrived unbound and were bound into two volumes in 1935 by Douglas Cockrell. When I worked for Roger Powell, he used to tell us stories about Cockrell's conservation and binding of the codex. And so from a personal point of view, there was a lovely circularity in, being, in leading the conservation of the Codex Sinaiticus project some 60 years later, and finding in the archives all the materials testing and all the treatments and all the correspondence between Powell and um, Cockrell. Then there are 43 leaves in Leipzig University Library in Germany, and those are currently unbound. There are four portions of leaves in the National Library of Russia in St. Petersburg, and those are currently framed. And then there are some or all of 18 leaves in St. Catherine's Monastery in Mount Sinai in Egypt. They were recovered by the monks from the northern wall of the monastery in um, 1975. And from a conservation point of view, they're in the worst condition. 
The project was essentially to digitize the leaves and bring the manuscript back together on the web, to reunify it virtually. But it was much more than that. So there was imaging under standard light and raking light. Um, then there's the content metadata. There's a new trans uh, transcription. It's in Greek. Um, uh, the text is in Greek. So there's a new transcription into Greek. There are translations into modern Greek, Russian, German, and English. And then there's the physical description. This physical description was part of the conservation element of the project, with major collaboration with the curatorial investigations, with extensive examination of the scriber link, the code ecological features, the previous repairs, the current condition, the conservation undertaken, and all, all the surface characteristics of the parchment. So for example here, you can see those um, curves on the left-hand side. They are striations made by the, uh, thought to be made by the parchment maker's knives. The same documentation methodology was used in each of the four locations and, uh, and then um, embed it in the website. So I'm not aware of this level of examination being so systematically embedded in any other such project. And it's great to hear, I've just learned that it's been shortlisted for the UK's Conservation Awards. And then there's a whole series of essays on the website which are being um, consistently added to. Now this was a seven year, one and a half million dollar project. The next step was, to, uh, was a much shorter, less expensive project to digitize all the British Library's Greek manuscripts, building on what was learned from the Codex and Atticus project and using crowdsourcing. So what was being called, as I left the British Library, expertonomies, whereby scholars input their research so that it wasn't just BL um, experts writing the text. And then there were folksonomies whereby non-scholars could input. Their, their, so taking it from being a boutique digitization project to a wider project contri contributing to this critical mass of content. So here's the thing. Here's the paradox. Articulated on the day that the world's earliest surviving text of the New Testament was virtually reunified, on the day that 20 million people saw it reunified, on the day that the term Codex Sinaiticus was amongst the top 20 Google searches worldwide, and on the day that there were over 700 news articles about um, the project. On that day, on the 6th of July, 2009, on the Guardian newspaper's blog, Shirley Dent of the Institute of Ideas, she said, we've long been aware that a plethora of literature can be made available through digitized open sources such as Project Gutenberg, but ironically, the potential to make literature available online in downloadable and now ebook reader format has also been heralded as the slow death of the book as we know it. What the Codex Sinaiticus project illustrates is that the opposite could be true. Digital technology may not only preserve hard codices that even with the best conservation intentions will always be vulnerable to the ravages of time, we may in fact be on the brink of digitally resurrecting, reinterpreting and reinvigorating that past. My third paradox is around the inevitable classic tension between preservation and access, which has been debated since the beginning of preservation as a, as a profession. Personally, I've pretty much changed my views since starting as a naive and idealistic conservator at the Victoria and Albert Museum, when I first thought the best way to preserve fragile materials was to prevent damage by keeping people away from fragile special collections. Now my starting point is how to make things accessible and then work backwards. There's an inherent paradox in making material available. Nicely summarized, I think, in a recent UK research project entitled Catch-22. The Catch-22 was that access to heritage objects make, brings social benefit. Greater access brings greater social benefit. Greater access brings greater damage and greater damage brings reduced social benefit. So access brings social benefit, greater access, greater social benefit, greater access, greater damage, greater damage, reduced social benefit. 
One approach to squaring this particular circle is to take a strategic management approach. Whenever we make material available, we're putting it at risk. And I was very much involved in collection security in my last role. So um, I think for, for Smiley III, um, Farhad Hakimzadeh, uh, there was a case reported only last week of the ex-department head of the National Archives here arrested in his house by FBI agents. But the risk to collections is far wider than from theft. There's a whole risk and compliance industry that analyzes probability and severity of risks. And in the world of conservation and preservation, there are various methods for assessing risk of collections. For example, that um, developed at the Canadian Museum of, of Nature. Most of you will know this method. But it defines agents of deterioration and risk factors, for example, earthquakes, pests, environmental factors, dissociation, which is a renaming of that um, previously somewhat pejorative custodial neglect and security and so on. Ironically, I think an integrated risk management approach encourages innovation and entrepreneurship, which we hear so much about. And it encourages risk taking because it encourages an organization to identify risks, identify mitigation of risks, and actually to be explicit about what its risk appetite is. It compels an organization to acknowledge what's risky, identify the unknown, give a name to fear and fear of failure, and then that can help inform your strategy. Risk assessments were carried out on all the collections at the British Library. So here's the British Library. Um, and there was a risk assessment of all the digital collections, um, which helped determine the digital preservation strategy. So, for exa example, we discovered there was already 3% um, loss of um, legal deposit um, CDs. And then we did a risk assessment of the physical collections using the um, uh, Canadian Museum of Nature's methodology. And um, the two highest risks, I was going to ask what people thought they were, but I can't see anyone, actually. What, <laughs> would you shout out? <laughs> what do you think were the two highest risks of the 150 million physical items of the British Library? Being lost. Being lost, okay. Any others? Water damage. Water damage, actual, okay. Any others? Uh, interesting, yes. Um, actually, if you can see, there's the British Library. Can you see behind is St Pancras Station, which is um, the new Eurostar station, which is actually a, um, an issue for the security of the British Library. Um, the, the two highest priority, um, excuse me, the two highest risks were, actually, wear and tear, given that three million items are issued every year in the reading rooms and security, which is the price of giving access to 400,000 visits to the reading rooms, um, but they can obviously be uh, mitigated. I'd be very interested, actually, uh, either um, in the debates or, uh, excuse me, any questions afterwards or at the reception, if anyone else has done these risk assessments, um, because I think there's a huge value in comparing results. And I do know of another organization which have had a very unexpected result, which found that one of its major sources of risk was from actually having boxed so much of its material because um, what, it was a very high use um, collection and everything as, um, as the uh, material was being uh, transported to the reading rooms, it was getting a lot of, um, it was very fragile material in boxes that, didn't, uh, that were too big for it and was actually causing a lot of damage. If, um, if we'd done this risk assessment 10 years ago at the British Library, I'm pretty sure that the results would have been different. Um, I think the highest, one of the highest risks would have been from environmental factors. But since there's been massive improvement in improved buildings over 15 years, that will take the BL from um, before 1998 when it moved into that, that building, um, you could say none of its collections, 0% of its collections were in satisfactory environmental conditions. As it moved in there, which was where half the collections went, that went to 42%. And then with the completion of the massive new um, storage building, 
When that's full, uh, the new density store is full in, in 2011, it'll go to 66%. So over 15 years, two-thirds of the collections will have gone into satisfactory environmental conditions. So that minimizes that risk. And I know the Canadian Museum of Nature, their risk profile changed over time. Um, they had identified storage as a major issue, and then they uh, made improvements um, and mitigated it. And as to Harvard, well, watch this space. I think I'll finish, actually, um, with a couple of paradoxes and contradictions around funding. And we'll illustrate it with the British Library's Center for Conservation, uh, which some of you may already have visited. So preservation is the custodian and champion of long-termism. And yet, ironically, it's often trapped in short-term decision-making and funding. And a nice paradox that I've observed in my first few months here in an endowment culture um, is that a lot of preservation is supported by non-core funding and soft endowment or fundraised money. The good side of this paradox is that it does generally seem attractive to donors and endowments but I would be very, very interested in your um, thoughts and experience on this. Well, um, at the BL, I encountered an infuriating paradox. When we were fundraising for the $25 million um, Center for Conservation, which I was very heavily involved with over nine years from um, its conception through to its completion. So this is the, now, this is the back of the British Library and is the Center for Conservation, uh, which is the first new build since um, that uh, the St. Pancras building was completed in 1998. Um, and there's the Eurostar station um, at the back. This was um, a major project. Uh, it included state-of-the-art studios for audio and book conservation. And fundamental, absolutely fundamental to the whole concept was public access. These studios were designed to have weekly behind-the-scenes tours for the public um, and lectures and seminars. Um, the entrance is a permanent exhibition about what is inside the building. Um, and so, for example, on the right there, there's an interactive where you as a visitor can make decisions about um, how to conserve, um, I think it was a 19th century uh, printed book. Or you can preserve a sound recording, um, such as, um, I think this was Nelson Mandela's um, trial tapes. Um, and you can compare your restored version with that of an audio archivist's. There was a huge emphasis on training and development um, of both staff and also um, of the profession. And we set up a degree, a foundation degree, in conjunction with the University of the Arts. There were sponsored internships in book paper and audio conservation and preservation. So this was a high-risk project. It was the first capital fundraising project for the British Library. And the irony was that we could get funding for the training, for the internships, and we could get funding for the public program. So that, uh, this exhibition area, we could have sold the naming rights um, five times over. But for the conservation, um, we couldn't get funding, as that was seen as a core mandate of the British Library. And ironically, fundraising for the building was challenging as well, even though usually people will support buildings and equipment and not what um, goes on in them. And yet, the irony was, if we didn't get the funding for the building, we couldn't do the activities. We couldn't do the conservation, the training, the public programs that went on inside them. So, um, lots of paradoxes. Lots of ironies, lots of contradictions. Um, what are some of the lessons from my uh, professional journey from artisan conservation? When Roger Powell, he used to introduce all his assistants as fourth generation arts and crafts. So I've gone from artisan conservation to strategic management in, a large -scale, in large scale research libraries in a climate of cloud computing and crowdsourcing. Well, the spectrum of preservation 
has got bigger, broader, wider, and more complicated. From artisan conservation at one end of the spectrum, there are many, many more shades. Through a whole rethinking of environmental parameters of storage and energy efficiency, through to collections-wide risk assessment, through to bitstream preservation, emulation, and virtual universal computing. The spectrum of preservation has got bigger, broader, and wider. And all this chopping of preservation and conservation into little chunks of book and paper and photographs and audio, visual, and digital, it, I don't think it makes sense anymore. They're all part of that continuum of, of information, of information mediums, and they're all interconnected. And for those working in the field, no job is unchanged. Mine has changed exponentially, almost beyond recognition. And no sh job should be unchanged, and no job will be unchanged. For those involved with any aspect of preservation, everyone's touched by these issues and should be actively engaged with them in order to remain relevant. And are the next generation being trained with that full spectrum? There's usually a time lag. Um, where's my successor? Where are, are there enough people in the system who already are spanning this spectrum? So preservation has changed, and then the nature of what's being preserved has changed. We still have the legacy of physical collections, and digitization has become a lot more sophisticated. As the critical mass grows and projects join up and digital scholarship mines data and texts in new ways, that's challenging some of the assumptions that underpinned preservation as it was practiced even a generation ago. Now we can use advanced technology to make rare objects more accessible, not less. Artificially reconstructed objects can be more authoritative than the authentic fragments. So coming full circle to my first paradox about preservation being about the future more than the past, with these futuristic ventures, we can be more true to the past. So thank you uh, once again, Bobby, for inviting me. I was very honored to be asked to give this talk. Thank you all for coming. I'm extremely honored you all came. <laughs> and uh, thank you for your patience.